Welcome to Bird Ultrasound Case of the Week, and the title this week is A Chink in the Armour. When I perform a musculoskeletal examination, you might think that I'm rather infatuated by the tendons, the ligaments, all of the soft tissue structures, and that's fair enough. But there's another component that I'm really interested in, and that is the bone surfaces. Now, while ultrasound doesn't have the ability to penetrate through bone and have a look for bone marrow edema, and we're not particularly sensitive for fractures and this type of thing, we do see the surface architecture of the bone. So when I scan around the musculoskeletal system, if I'm doing a foot or a wrist, for example, the anatomy of the bones is a little bit complicated, but I need to know at all times exactly what bone I'm looking at. I also need to know at all times what that bone is supposed to look like sonographically. In other words, what the surface of it is supposed to look like. Which bits are covered by hyaline cartilage? Which bits represent an anthesis for a tendon attachment, for example? And which bits are just bare parts of the skeleton with nothing really attached onto them? Because all of these parts of the skeleton will look quite different sonographically. There's many different things that can put a little chink in the bone. If you get rheumatoid arthritis, for example, you'll get erosions, and this will cause little chinks in the bone. We also see chinks in the bone from enthesopathic disease process with traction injuries to an anthesis from a tendon attachment, for example. And then we might see other changes in the bone from processes like osteoarthritis, etc. So at all times, we need to understand what the bone is supposed to look like in a healthy volunteer, how the bone has changed, and if it has changed, what the diagnosis is that's led to that change in bone architecture. There is, however, one little chink in the bone that we see very, very commonly that is not pathological. And you need to know about it. You need to understand the pathophysiology of it so you don't fall down the rabbit hole of calling it some sort of pathology. So let's have a look in a very simplistic way of the anatomy of a joint. If we imagine this is the humeral head here, this is the beautiful hyaline cartilage on the humeral head, and this is the, uh, the bone of the proximal humerus here. To make a joint, we need to have a joint capsule. Now, of course, there would be another bone here, which would be the glenoid, and the joint capsule would actually sit between the glenoid and the humeral head. But for simplicity's sake, so I'm just going to put the joint capsule over the top of the hyaline cartilage. And where it comes back to the humerus here, it has to attach onto the bone so it needs a little anthesis attachment right here at this point here and right here at this point here and these always occur right at the edge at the margin of the hyaline cartilage where the hyaline cartilage is just finishing and that first little piece of bone that's available the joint capsule says thank you very much I'm attaching on there and it makes us bond with the bone through the magic of course of an anthesis. Now over the top of the joint capsule we also then have the supraspinatus muscle coming across here and it of course also has an anthesis with the greater tuberosity here. So now let's magnify this image and have a closer look at it. What we can see here is we can see the hyaline cartilage of the humeral head, we can see the joint capsule of the glenohumeral joint in green here, and we can see the supraspinatus tendon in blue coming over the top, attaching onto the greater tuberosity of the humerus here. This yellow line here represents the anthesis for the supraspinatus tendon where it's attaching onto the greater tuberosity. This little red line is the anthesis where the joint capsule is attaching onto also a part of the greater tuberosity because it's just after the hyaline cartilage finishes, just at this point here, there has to be a little anthesis for that glenohumeral joint capsule to attach on. Now, if we saw some bone erosions here, so in other words, bone erosions that are affecting the hyaline cartilage of the humeral head, we would say this is generally from an osteoarthritis process. This would be very, very common, and we see this almost every week in our clinical practice where we have a degree of osteoarthritis of the glenohumeral joint. We also see every week where we have little erosions here. So little subperiosteal cysts would be the more correct term to use, and these are traction injuries where the supraspinatus tendon has been overloaded from its anthesis and you get little subperiosteal cysts forming in this location and adjacent to that you'll see little small partial thickness articular surface tears forming and these are very very common and then we have another potential spot for a little erosion and that's right here where the joint capsule attaches on and this is not pathological this is called a synovial herniation pit and shouldn't be confused with a partial thickness articular surface tear or osteoarthritis, or in fact, anything pathological. They're quite normal, and we see them all around the body. We see them a lot in the glenohumeral joint, but we can also see them in the hip joint and other articulations around the body where a joint capsule is attaching onto the skeleton immediately adjacent to some hyaline cartilage, and you get a little synovial herniation pit forming in this location. So if we have a look at this beautiful transverse view of the supraspinatus tendon, when you look at the collagen of the supraspinatus tendon, it looks quite pristine, and they can see nice hyaline cartilage there. And then we have this 
quite broad area where there's some little pitting of the bone there in the short axis. And that pitting is in a location immediately adjacent to the hyaline cartilage and just at the beginning of the anthesis for the supraspinatus tendon. And I wonder what you're thinking when you see this. Do you think that this is evidence of some overloading injury to the supraspinatus tendon? Is this some sort of subperiosteal cyst formation? Because the answer is it's not really, because it's happening at this location right here. So just where the glenohumeral joint capsule attaches onto the humeral head and immediately adjacent to the supraspinatus anthesis. If you look at it in the long axis, you can see that it's almost like a, a channel that's being cut through. There's the biceps tendon, and there's a nice little channel running anterior and posterior, immediately adjacent to the hyaline cartilage. And this channel is a nice little linear line of synovial herniation pits. Radiographically, this is the location where they occur. So was it tempting to call these features that I've just shown you pasta tears or rim rent tears? In other words, articular surface partial thickness tears of the supraspinatus tendon and to give this a pathological importance? Well, the answer to that question is it's not a pasta tear. It's not an articular surface partial thickness tear at all. It is, in fact, a synovial herniation pit and should be considered part of the spectrum of normal. These are pasta tears. So these are articular surface partial thickness tears, and they're different in a very important way. The difference here is that the subperiosteal cyst forms slightly distal to where the synovial herniation pits form, and also immediately adjacent to the subperiosteal cyst, you can see some architectural change inside the supraspinatus tendon. So this is clear evidence of a partial thickness articular surface tear here. The location I would expect to see a synovial herniation pit is just slightly proximal in this location here, and immediately adjacent to it, I would expect the collagen to look pristine and normal. In fact, the collagen that sits immediately adjacent to a synovial herniation pit is not really supraspinatus per se, it's actually the rotator cuff cable, which is a reflection of the coracohumeral ligament that runs across underneath the supraspinatus tendon, immediately adjacent to the joint capsule, and sits immediately on top of where these little synovial herniation pits form. So when you look immediately adjacent to the synovial herniation pit, you should see some healthy collagen, and that healthy collagen, if you trace it back anatomically, will be a component of the coracohumeral ligament, or rotator cuff cable, if you like. This is another example of a real tear, however, and you can see that there is definitely a defect in the tendon. You can see the nice, almost anechoic area here inside the tendon. You can see the way that there is multiple little subperiosteal cysts. A classic synovial herniation pit would be in this location here, but these are scattered a little bit more distally and adjacent to it. You can see there is indeed a partial thickness tear in the deep fibres of the supraspinatus tendon. This is a true pasta tear. Here's another nice example of a pasta tear. So you can see again that these subperiosteal cysts are slightly more distally located. They have collagen immediately adjacent to it that is hypoechoic and looks abnormal. And this is in fact a partial thickness articular surface tear. Let's go back and have another look at this one. And you can see the difference here. You can see how the synovial herniation pit is much, much closer to the hyaline cartilage. It's really immediately adjacent to it because this is the bit of real estate that the joint capsule of the glenohumeral joint uses to attach onto the greater tuberosity. It's its own little piece of anthesis. And if you look at the collagen immediately superficial to this synovial herniation pit, you can see that you can't fault it. It looks perfectly normal. And this is really coracohumeral ligament rotator cuff cable collagen that is in the pink of health, and there's no problem here. So we're going to see these in multiple locations when we do shoulder ultrasound. And this is a very, very common location. If you look at the subscapularis tendon in the long axis, you very commonly see these little synovial herniation pits just where the hyaline cartilage finishes, just where the anthesis begins. And if we're going to call all of these tears, then so many of my patients are going to have a tear of the subscapularis. And this is not the usual location of a subscapularis tear. These are little synovial herniation pits. They're almost so common in this location of subscapularis, they're quite ubiquitous. You see them day in, day out. And I imagine that many sonographers will notice them and just ignore them. Even if they're not exactly sure what they are, they'll just ignore them because they know that every second patient has one of these. But what they are, in fact, is a little synovial herniation pit. Here's another really nice example of one in the subscapularis. And you can see on the plain x-ray, this little niche in the bone there, a little synovial herniation pit, just at the end of the hyaline cartilage. Remember, the hyaline cartilage comes around here and finishes at this location. This is the this bit of flat bone here is the anthesis for the subscapularis, and that little chink there is a little synovial herniation pit. That's the same area that you're seeing there sonographically. That little chink in the bone there, the little chink in the armour, is a little synovial herniation pit.
Another really common location is in infraspinatus. And with infraspinatus, you'll see these day in, day out. And again, it's in the same classic location. And once again, the collagen adjacent to the little synovial herniation pit is perfectly healthy. One tricky thing with infraspinatus synovial herniation pits is their proximity to where you may expect to see a hill sax deformity. And these synovial herniation pits in this location can be quite broad and quite deep. So if I have a patient that's had a dislocation and I'm thinking about a hill sax deformity, I'll be forced to be quite cautious about this bony architecture and say that the little defect that I'm seeing in the bone because of the history of a dislocation may in fact be a little hill sax deformity, a little fracture in the posterior humeral head. However, a synovial herniation pit is another differential diagnosis and we might need some plain radiographs for a start and maybe even some cross-sectional imaging to answer the riddle. Here's another example of quite a broad synovial herniation pit in the infraspinatus. And you can see how if this patient, for example, had had a dislocation, how when you look at this, you scratch your head and you think, gee, are we looking at a hill sax deformity here or are we looking at a synovial herniation pit? It can be really difficult. That's why we rely on the plain radiographs and the cross-sectional imaging in these cases. But what you will notice as you gain experience in musculoskeletal ultrasound is you see this type of appearance week in, week out in patients that have never had any history of any trauma to their shoulder. And we'll often even see this type of appearance in young, healthy volunteers when we're running workshops, etc. And it's nothing to be concerned about. So I hope now you feel confident that you can tell the difference between a synovial herniation pit and a little partial thickness articular surface tear of any of these rotator cuff tendons. It is a great piece of knowledge to have uh, to prevent you from doing the classic MSU and making stuff up and making a false positive diagnosis in a patient that simply has a normal anatomical synovial herniation pit. If you're interested in a more detailed look at all the other little chinks in the bone that you can get from erosions from gout, erosions from rheumatoid, osteoarthritis changes, enthesopathic changes, etc., etc., please visit birdultrasound.com.au and enjoy the full-length version of What is That Chink in the Bone? Happy scanning and bye for now.